We're here at the Biannual Aerial Firefighting Convention in McClellan, the old McClellan Air Force Base. It's just McClellan Field now here in California. Everybody that's in the firefighting industry is here today. It's a bit like old home week for me, and it's also a great opportunity to get the latest on what's going on with fire and aviation around the world today. Check it out. The air tanker business has changed a lot over the years and is now a global year-round firefighting industry. But one thing that hasn't changed is the passionate and devoted people that work in this industry. Friends you meet working here are friends for life. So I'm going to break this series up in a series of interviews with some of the movers and shakers in the industry. And we're going to start with my old instructor, Mike Lynn, and what he's doing at Aero Flight. This is going air. live, Mikey. No cussing, no swearing. Let's get you in the picture here. You're a lot bigger than me. So? Recording, not live, but we're recording. And uh, fortunately, we have an editing machine here. Okay. Also. So, this is Mike Lynn, lifelong friend, and who has saved my life in training. He was my instructor uh, mm -hmm. training in the U.S. Forest Service lead plane program. A, a, a gentle, quiet instructor that will save your tail. You've been in this industry for years. <laughs> and now, where, where are you at now? We're over here with Aeroflight and Con Air. Yes. So uh, I, ha I had a 20-year career with the uh, U.S. Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. 2013, uh, I retired. Uh, that didn't seem to work out too well for me. You didn't like sitting around the house, <laughs> no, did you? It no. is, it's not good training for retirement. No, you know, fire. fire gets fire gets in your blood, and it's just uh, really hard to uh, get out of it and, and relax uh, for the rest of your life. So um, a friend of mine who owned uh, the company Aeroflight uh, called me up and said, would you please uh, come over and uh, give us a hand with the safety program? And uh, I was there the next day. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't wait. So uh, I got there, and uh, the company was in good shape anyway, uh, and the owner was a long, 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 long time friend. Anyway, uh, uh, he uh, decided to sell the company to uh, a company called Conair, which is up in uh, Canada. And uh, by joining uh, the two companies together, we became the world's largest aerial firefighting company. And uh, so we moved the company up to Spokane. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is uh, we were closer to uh, our mother company, mm -hmm. and they had a hangar there in Spokane. So uh, it was a, it was a big move. We moved uh, 34 people from Kingman to Spokane. Very successful uh, move, and we're, we're now entrenched in Spokane. <laughs> yeah. So you showed up there and they fired you and then they rehired yeah, well, you? Well, and... they did. Uh, yeah, as soon as I got there, they said, hey, uh, we're firing you. And I was a little surprised. And and they said, yeah, you're, you're no longer safety guy. Uh, you're director of flight operations. Wow. And I go, oh, boy. So now I got people to look after. But anyway, um, we hired a, a, another safety officer, a fantastic guy. was with us for a long time. I've been in flight ops now um, 
since uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been putting together. The, the ongoing theme here at the show has been the, on, the pilot shortage and the shortage of people in general in the aviation industry. And you put together a real coalition of different folks from different agencies because in the back of the old days, <laughs> well, what was it like in the old days? Well, back in the old days, uh, it, it was, uh, by gosh and my golly, it was barnstorming, to tell you the truth. Uh, there wasn't much training. Uh, it's just the way it was. Uh, you showed up, you hopped in the airplane, and you went. And it was a seasonal thing. It was just a summer gig. Yeah, we were gypsies, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, But because of that, um, we did lose crews. And, uh, and it was due to uh, poor training. Uh, not very much oversight in safety. Maintenance was, uh, I don't want to make everybody sound like, you know, it was just out, people out to kill you, but I mean, you had to watch your, you had to watch yourself. And um, but anyway, uh, so the industry has grown quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've evolved, uh, we've gotten better. And uh, one of my projects was to bring in people uh, from other uh, backgrounds. So w we had the old guard firefighters. Uh, I wanted to hire some airline people to fly some of the new jets that we were getting uh, to bring in uh, their kind of background with SOP standardization uh, and, and safety. And then we also hired uh, some uh, Air Force uh, people and then we also hired some new pilots straight out of Embry-Riddle. And so with that combination of uh, learning, experiences, SOPs, I wanted to mix everything all together so that we could be a very cohesive group. There were some learning curves because of the older guard firefighters, but we overcame those things. Uh, and it was, uh, well, right now we're at a point where we feel very comfortable. Uh, our SOPs, our standardization, our safety, I think is top notch. Uh, I don't want to say that we're the best of uh, the best, but I think we are. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so we just wanted to change the way that we fought fire uh, in the past. Uh, people talk about that these are the next generation of air tankers. They are the next generation of air tankers when we were flying DC-4s. Now we're in C-130s and uh, 737s and DC-10s and Avros. But along with that, uh, we had to change our way of thinking, our way of management, way of maintenance, and we had to really up our game. Uh, unfortunately, I've lost many, many friends, very, very, very good friends. And uh, so I take it upon myself uh, as a legacy for them to assure that we aren't gonna do that anymore. And that's why we've really upped the game in training, safety, and in management. It all comes together. And, and it's trickle down. If management doesn't back us up in safety, training, then it goes right on down and, and it's gonna be a disaster. And we're not gonna do that. Wow. Can you give us a, a little war story about one of the things you overcame we were talking about over lunch or breakfast? For example, the, av the, the uh, jets that you're flying now have auto throttles, but you don't use auto throttles or autopilot, obviously, when you're firefighting. You use it when you're coming and going to the fire to reduce pilot fatigue. But you get on the fire, you need to hand fly the aircraft. But you've developed a standard operating procedure where, effectively, the first officer becomes the auto throttles, yes. the operator of the auto throttles, and the captain then becomes, just flies the aircraft and runs the radios. Right. And so... Um and that's the way that we do things, and, and so what we do is below 500 feet, we'll turn off all the automation. So the autopilot comes off, uh, auto throttles come off, and the captain uh, is relinquishing the uh, throttles, the power levers, to the first officer so that the captain can pay attention looking straight ahead, looking at the fire, talking to the lead plane or the air tech, so that their attention is not diverted to looking at the engine instruments or, or anything else. Now, the captain will uh, set parameters for the first officer to pay attention to. I want 130 knots, I want 140 knots, uh, I want flaps here. And that, that's just a normal procedure that's in the checklist. But it, it lets the captain then pay attention to what is important to him to drop the uh, retard, push his button in the exact spot. Uh, that it needs to go in. Now, once all of this is done and they go back up above 500 feet, then everything goes back to automation. Autopilot comes on, 
speed is set, and uh, the auto throttles are, are just come on automatically, but everything goes back to automation. So um, we just don't want anybody below 500 feet relying upon automation when it should be the pilot that's actually doing the flying. Wow, and that met, you met some resistance with that from some of the old timers, and yeah. they almost threatened to <laughs> bail out on you, but they finally came around. And... They, they did. Uh, yeah, they, they didn't like uh, going, they, they wanted to have their hands right. on the power levers. I don't blame them. I, I, I actually thought the opposite of that when I was flying C 130s, but uh, what we did is uh, we had to uh, convince them or have them convince us that that was the way to go. We wanted to listen to them. And that's a great part of our SOPs, is they're a very fluid document. They can change at any time as long as we discuss it. Well, this got to be a pretty heated discussion, mm -hmm. and we, we did studies on it. We actually uh, took took two pilots and did a test program during the fire season and let them try it the other way, mm -hmm. had them write all their notes down, and uh, then we had uh, actually some other people observe this, this operation. And then uh, we did come up with a white paper, a risk analysis, and uh, then we convened all the pilots, pro and con, in a meeting to discuss it. I was going to be the final uh, guy that says, okay, this is the way it's going to go. But after listening to everything, I think we were in the right path and we stayed with the SOPs we did. After it was done, we did have some resistance, but uh, phenomenally, it, it went away quite quickly and everybody adapted to the SOPs. Now, what we want by that, and you, you, you will understand this, uh, flying with the airlines, we, we want to be able to uh, have a captain take on a first officer that uh, has never flown with him before, and everything is set, it's doing the it the same way. Yep, yep. Yeah, and now that's not complacency, that's this good uh, CRM, and, and, and we're having uh, nothing that goes wrong. And if it does go wrong, and there is a bump, then everybody can follow their procedures and fix it. So, um, yeah, it, it worked out quite well. But, but it was a cooperative agreement between all the crew members. And brought to you by none other than Mikey Lynn himself. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mike, tell us about, let's see if we can do this here. Let me pan this down a little bit. Tell us about this new airplane here. So this, this is, it, here yeah, this is the Q400. Uh -huh. um, uh, it was uh, been manufactured for quite a while now. Uh, the uh, French have been operating it as an air tanker, and actually they call it a multi-role aircraft. So uh, as you can see, here's the tank that sets kind of around the fuselage. A lot of people think it looks like a hot dog bun, <laughs> and it doesn't look like that. But it, it hauls 2,600 gallons, a little bit more than that, but 2,600 gallons. And if uh, the French are done with the fire season, they can take this tank and it slips right off, goes, goes off of the airplane, and they can put seats in there, they can put gurneys, they can do law enforcement, they can haul cargo down to uh, Africa for uh, aid down there. Uh, so that's why they call it the Q400MR. Now, um, uh, Conair is uh, building up uh, six more of these for France. They've delivered two of them, they're brand, they're brand new. Uh, but in the meantime, we've acquired Conair and Aeroflight, two of the Q400s for ourselves. I uh, am hopeful that these airplanes will start to replace our, our jets, which you can see in the background, the Avro RJ85. It, it's almost just as fast, it hauls just a little bit less retardant, but it burns 53% less fuel. Uh -huh. That's a big deal. It not only helps the environment, it helps if you're in the Green New Deal, but... <laughs> Don't roll your eyes sorry, now, Mikey. <laughs> sorry about that. But but it, it saves the Forest Service a lot of money, 53% mm -hmm. less fuel burn. So and, and the speed is the same and almost the same retardant. So uh, it's a great platform. It's very modern. I mean, uh, it's is not it? as modern as the 777, but it's there. <laughs> oh, yeah. It probably is. Uh, is that your own proprietary tank design? It is. It is. And is it? can you pressurize the aircraft with the tank on it? So oh, I, I think I've hit a nerve here. No, 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 no. This is why, <laughs> this is why I'd love to take you into the hangar and yes, show you that. Yes. So when you take the fairings off in the front and you look at the tank installation, mm -hmm. The tank does not touch the fuselage at all. Oh, okay. There, there, kind of, huh, there's about that much of a gap all the way around. So, as you know, when you pressurize a, fu a fuselage, it, ex hole in that. Yeah, it expands. <laughs> so, uh, you can expand the fuel, you can pressurize, oh, and, okay. and it doesn't touch the tank or do any damage. 
So um, when I was flying the 130, the tank was internal. If we pressurized the fuselage, we were actually pushing retardant out the doors. <laughs> it just could, yeah, it was leaking all the time. <laughs> well, you don't have this problem with this tank. Uh -huh. Now this tank is very similar to the one that's on the RJ. You can kind of see back so there. So it's got holes in the bottom of it. It's a long, uh, long door. Mm -hmm. It's a long door. Yeah. But and there's also vents on the top here uh, that you can't see. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, it's a very versatile tank. It's, it's easy to take off, it's easy to keep clean, and like I said, if, if you need it off, it comes off very quickly. The same with the RJ, it comes off very quickly. Okay, and can you tell us what your minimum pilot requirements are for guys looking to uh, put a resume in with, with you guys? So we have uh, two, two different uh, platforms. We have the CL415, uh, which is an amphibious water scooping firefighter, mm -hmm. and then we have the Avro. Mm -hmm. So now the uh, 415, we're requiring uh, for first officers to have uh, around 3,000, 3,500 hours. Wow. It's, it's pretty high. Yeah. And, uh, but what we really like to see is um, people that have backcountry strip, strip time, see? flying uh, beavers or uh, single engine otters into hunting camps in Alaska. We have people who have been flying twin otters in the Maldives and Croatia. Uh, in fact, we just we hired just a couple years ago a, a gal that was flying uh, twin otters in Croatia. She was also flying uh, 180s off of glaciers in Alaska, mm -hmm. flights helicopters and an AMP mechanic. Mm -hmm. Wow! Mm -hmm. well, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the old days, being an AMP mechanic was crucial to the job because you had to keep the money maker right, running. Right. Right. Now in the RJ, uh, we we haven't lowered our standards but we'll take people with less time. Mm -hmm. uh, the 415 is a little bit more specialized. Mm -hmm. The RJ will we'll take people uh, around the 2000 mark. 2000? Yeah, right, 2000 good. hours. Cool. And it still takes about a season and a half minimum to get Yeah, so uh, let's, say that, let's say you become a first officer and you are carded as a, as a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. It can take anywhere between a year and a half to three years to become a captain. Yeah. You, there was a minimum, a uh, 25 drop minimum. Was that you were talking about that? Uh, right. And but you typically see what? We typically see our guys with at least 100 plus drops. 100 drops. And that's yeah. just because, uh, well, there's a lot of different factors, but uh, the the jets are are flying in so many different areas within one day. We can be in Florida in the morning, San Bernardino, California in the morning, and then up to Redding in the afternoon. And so sometimes you don't get a lot of drops and you get a lot of ferry times. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate. But uh, we also want to see that these pilots uh, that are upgrading to initial attack have experience in different regions. So California has its own Oh yeah. Own problem. Southern California is like its own unique species oh, of yeah. wires and everything down there. That's where we did a lot of our training. Yeah, that's it's right. Like the hardest uh, flying there is. It is. Uh, versus, let's say, a fire out in the middle of Montana, mm -hmm. where you only maybe get one air tanker every two hours. You know, <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit different. But uh, I cut my teeth in Southern California. That's, yeah. that's where I got you all. Such a great uh, yeah, instructor. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so but anyway, uh, we. we um, I typically see uh, about a year and a half to two years and we want people to get uh, varying experience. Now uh, the funny thing about the Amphibs, the 415s, uh, those guys can get uh, 20, 30, 40 drops within a fuel cycle mm -hmm. and so basically they could they could get their initial attack card. Fire. Yeah, uh, yeah, in one fuel cycle. <laughs> well, <laughs> We don't want that. Yeah, we want. We want. Yeah, that. yeah. So uh, I think our last guy that got an initial attack rating, I think he was almost 500 drops. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so uh, what the Forest Service has done, because of the drops, uh, they, they've changed it to missions. And so now you, they, session, they, they will be starting at 150 if you'd like to make your way to the tents. We got time. Yeah. So they want you to uh, have missions in instead of drops. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those guys are in the 415s are getting 40 drops in a fuel cycle. That counts as one mission now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you so, go. And, 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 and you know what? There's nothing wrong with you that. You sound like Yosarian in Catch-22 as soon as they, <laughs> yeah. they change the rules as soon as you reach the goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Catch-22. Yeah, catch <laughs> All right, Mikey Lynn, Aero Flight, man. Thanks so much. Thanks, buddy. <laughs>